Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Benji. Welcome, everybody, to the first ever AGCs class. So we're going to do some deep dives uh, over the next couple of classes and categories of cheese. We've had such a fun time doing these kind of broad stroke discussions, whether it's Italian cheeses or charcuterie or cheese in this and cheese in that. And uh, tonight's really exciting because we're going to just talk one category. Um, as Benji mentioned, we are recording. So if anybody doesn't want to show us their beautiful faces and their quarantine haircuts, uh, go ahead and take your video down. But otherwise, uh, it will be up on YouTube later. So you can go back and check all the highlights, uh, double check the pronunciation of such great places as Tupertville. Um, and so today we're going on a, on a tour through the Alps. It's a really cool uh, tasting. I think you guys are going to enjoy it. Um, as always, we have a couple other resources besides myself in tonight's tasting. So you have Benji uh, acting as the MC and making sure we're, uh, you know, hitting our cues and not missing anything. And then we have Will, who's going to be mostly in the chat in the beginning, but we'll also, you know, pepper himself in to make sure, uh, yeah, we don't miss anything. So ask questions, use the chat function, raise your hand, which is actually a function in the chat. You can put up a little emoji hand, um, unmute yourself. It's a pretty small group tonight. So it always is more fun with the interaction. We love to hear your questions and tonight should be no different. Um, cool. Oh, and the last thing for those who haven't done these before, make sure you go ahead and eat, try everything, taste things in different combinations. Don't always wait for me. I will promise to talk about every single thing tonight, but as everybody who's been to these knows, I can get carried away. So if you're waiting, to try that second cheese and you just want to try, go ahead and try it. Don't, don't torture yourself here. Um, cool. Does anybody have any questions before we jump into the wine? But that said, just try to have a little restraint because if you're like my kids and you're already like mostly done with the holler hawker, you know, then you're going to miss it when you're, when, when we're actually talking about it. Yes. Good call. So keep yourself a little safety wedge off to the side but go ahead and enjoy yourself and then we'll talk about every single thing in front of you. Um, hopefully the kids haven't finished the wine yet. So let's jump into that. We have two beautiful wines. And so I mentioned tonight, we're talking about the Alps. Um, and for the cheeses, we're going to be specifically in the Alps the whole time. And it's going to be this really cool discussion of like where those where it intersects with different cultures and traditions, right? It's the Alps is the largest mountain range that's completely in Europe. Um, and it goes through all sorts of countries. So it's in Austria, it's in Italy, it's in Switzerland, it's in Germany. And every one of those areas and pockets has their own traditions, their own food cultures. And, you know, as many of you mongers fans knows, that's what Will and I love the most is kind of connecting you to all these different cultures and geographies. Um, so we're going to start our journey in Italy. Uh, in the Alto Adige. This is a really cool wine region. It's one of Will and my favorite regions. And it's just like, uh, it's one of those unexpected surprises if you're not familiar with it. And so um, you're in Italy, but you're bordering Austria and Switzerland, and you're a Germanic speaking area. Uh, the first time I believe we became aware of this wine, Will had it when he was visiting RN74, which was a restaurant I was cooking at. And they ordered an Italian wine and something with German lettering comes out and they're very confused. And this is like the beginning of this, what is going on with this wine? And, you know, throughout our food experiences, it's kind of circled back into our, uh, our knowledge. And it's, it's a really unique space. Well, did I get that story right? Yeah, that's exactly correct. We got a, uh, a Pinot from Alto, Alto Adige and it was at RN74 Jex. Jack's concurring, um, and it came to the table, and I was like, I, I'm, "I'm not. Is this the right wine?" And I had to really look at the look at the label and um, double check because the whole thing was in German. And I was, you know, I, you know, at some point, I had learned that. I loved it. Oh, you love the cheese. I love it. At some point, I had learned that you know it's a German-speaking region in Italy, but it wasn't at the the forefront of my mind. All right, I'm muting myself. Fair enough. The kids have a lot to say about Alto Adige. They hope to one day get there themselves. Um, and so, as Will mentioned, it's a, you know, we kind of know this about these different cultures coming up and, you know, 
settling in different regions. And I think that this is like our first highlighting of a theme we're going to have throughout our tasting tonight, which is all of these food traditions, well, they generally exist before the borders that we're talking about, right? And so um, that's how you get these little pockets of Germanic speaking Italians, right? Because they came from Germany, they came over with their family, and they kept their traditions. And so Alto Adige has these really great food friendly wines. Um, today, we're starting with a Pinot Grigio. Uh, Peter Zemmer is a multi-generation uh, producer, and they're in the lower part of the Alto Adige. So to give you some perspective, it's an area that goes from 600 feet all the way up to 3,300 feet. So not quite in that Alps. Um, it's considered a subalpine area. Uh, and when we get to the Alps, we're talking about like 4,800 feet, really high up there. Um, and so Peter Zemmer actually came and visited our shop, which is really cool. Uh, he is the namesake. His uncle started the, uh, the whole winery. He is the next generation in line. And I really loved, I was coming off of this natural wine kick when we got to meet Peter. And so I asked him, you know, is this a natural wine? He's like, eh, leave me alone. I make it like my uncle does, which I think is just this perfect answer. Um, not everything needs this buzzword. And so I was excited to show P Pinot Grigio because I think it's a wine that often gets skipped over. It's kind of like, I just need a inoffensive white wine. And I think this has so much character and it's a wine you see throughout the Alpine region, but through a bunch of different names. So that's the white we have, high acid, stone fruit, a little bit of lemon rind, really fun wine. The red we have is Schiava. So we're gonna go up a little bit higher into the mountain region. And this is an all female run winery. Um, I believe it's on its third generation. They're super into sustainability in every single facet from packaging to grape picking to production. They have a really, um, extensive kind of approach to that. And Schiava is another one of these more indigenous grapes. You don't really find Schiava anywhere else outside of Alto Adige. And it's, uh, I always think of it as spec wine. This, not like uh, a specification wine, but for spec, uh, for prosciutto and all these different cured meats, spec is really this like, for those who are familiar with this smoked prosciutto, kind of the cousin of prosciutto, there's a spec belt that kind of runs all the way through the Bavarian area and through the Alpine area. And it starts in Alto Adige. And these are perfect wines to pair with all those porcine delights. So um, I hope you enjoy both wines. And as always, we're going to kind of weave in and out of trying them through the cheeses. So if you want to participate with all of them, open both. And if you want to just open one, save the other one for another time. Does anybody have any questions before we delve into cheese? Good. Benji, we're doing all right? Yeah, looks like uh, you're, you're good to dive in. Good to dive in. Awesome. Okay, so the very first cheese we have is Comte. Yeah, what, what did Peter Zemmer have to say when he visited your store? What did he think? He seemed, he seemed into it. He liked it. You know, he's, uh, especially in Northern Italy, they're always way, way better dressed than you, and they're like very fancy people. Um, and so he was, you know, we drank wine and he walked around the store and said it was beautiful. I had just come back from Italy, so I was trying to show off and tell him where I was. He mostly was, you know, cool and aloof in like a cool <laughs> European way. Um, I was into it. Yeah, no, 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 that's great. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, okay, Conte, straight out of Conte. This is this cheese right here. You probably have a slightly smaller piece, but something about mountain cheeses, just having my little pieces just felt like inappropriate. They're big cheeses, so. Um, so Conte, these are cheeses, by the way, in all of our tastings, I always encourage you to play with your, your food. These are like the perfect Play-Doh cheeses. So all night, make sure you're giving them a little press and you'll learn a lot about each cheese because they're going to have really similar textures. We're talking about one category, but you'll get a lot of that nuance between your fingertips. Uh, Conte is a French cheese. It's coming out of the Jura mountains. So the Jura is another subalpine sub region. Um, and this is a, um, it's a lower mountain range, right? And it kind of, the Alpines fade right into the Jura. It's on Eastern France. It's in Eastern France. And we get a really special Conte. It's the same Conte I've been working with my entire career. And so it comes from Essex cheese. Essex cheese is an importer so cool that we did an entire tasting focused around them. And it's aged in Fort St. Antoine. So uh, Marcel Petit is the producer. And they have two facilities. And Fort St. Antoine is definitely the more 
uh, revered of the two facilities. And Fort St. Antoine is a decommissioned French army fort. Um, I love the idea that the French, you know, they're done with fighting, so let's fill this fort with cheese. I think that uh, the world will be a better place when that is how more military facilities turn to cheese facilities, but uh, I think we have a long way to go there. Um, and, you know, for me, this cheese is really, it's one of the more, I'd say like emotionally tied cheeses for me. I, I really love Conte. Somebody who really inspired me early on in my career was the lady who really brought this cheese into America. And I think it's, it really gives you this idea of, it's not bold, it's not a big sharp cheese, but there's an incredible amount of flavor. So every once in a while, someone will say it's mild. And I think if you really chew on it for a while, you'll, you'll go from mild to nuance. There's a lot going on in this cheese. And, and I'd be really curious if anybody has any flavor notes. Generally speaking, when I ask this question, no one really loves it. But I'd be curious if we have anybody ambitious out there um, who tastes something right off the bat. Because we're going to be in this category all night. So I think you're going to find things that come up over and over. And if anybody remembers from some of our discussions around, you know, flavor wheels, this is a great time when you're like, I don't know what he's talking about to break it out, right? You don't have to go all the way to this, like, I taste brown butter with a little sage. Like you can start by, do I taste lactic things? Do I taste meaty things, nutty things, fruity things? Um, for me, this cheese always really hits on nuttiness. And, and you know, the next question would be, well, what nut? Is it a roasted nut? Is it a raw nut? Is it candied? Um, what do people think? Does anybody get anything from this? I'm, I'm not good at the, the coming up with the answers to that, but uh, I definitely, I agree that it is nutty. That would have been the only word that I would have come up with, but no, I don't know. I speak too fast. Else. I should have let, yeah. I should have <laughs> let you get to that answer. Um, I get hazelnuts very specifically to me. Ponte always reminds me of toasted hazelnuts. It also has a lot of brown butter. And so as we kind of work our way up in intensity tonight, this is one of the like prettier mountain cheeses. Um, so let's, let's take a step back to talk about what is a mountain cheese because we're going to just keep talking about them all night. And you'll, you know, the most obvious answer is their cheese is made at high altitude, right? But there's a technical element to it. And there's a lot of American cheeses that are mimicking this concept. And they're not always, they don't always have altitude on their size. You know, one of our favorite examples is Pleasant Ridge Reserve, which is in Dodgeville, Wisconsin. That's not that high up there compared to the Alps. And so what is Andy at Pleasant Ridge doing to try to make a Comte or a Gruyere or a Schneebelhorn facsimile? Um, the biggest thing with a mountain cheese is that you're, when you're making the cheese, you're warming up the curds after you've kind of gotten them to that, that state, right? We go from milk setting it to curds. I cut the curds several times and I've drained out all the way. And when I have a drier curd, around the time we're in cheddar, I would cheddar the cheese. And we'll talk about that in, in round three of these classes. Around this same point, I'm gonna really heat the curds. Um, almost always in a copper lined vat. And then I'm gonna pour hot curds into the mold and press down. And so when we think of cheeses like a manchego, or a pecorino or a cheddar, you often have like a lot of little tiny holes in between the cheeses, right? There's like a, a porous texture, if you will, or a crumbly texture, but these all have like really dense, perfect textures. And that, that's why they're always used for like fondue and melting. By pressing them, you really knit all the proteins and the curds together in a way that when I go to melt it, it's really smooth. So that's kind of like the base idea of a mountain cheese. Uh, generally speaking, they're also brine cured. So, you know, cheese is milk, it's bacteria, but it's salt. You need salt in cheese. It's, it's how you keep everything kind of in the right balance. Otherwise, things will go off on a tangent. Those bacterias and those microfloras. And so salt keeps everything in, in balance. But how am I going to get salt up 4,000 feet into the Alps? That's really heavy. It takes a lot of work. And if I do that, I want to use my salt very strategically. And so most of these cheeses are brined. You have a big old bath of very salty water and you let the cheeses bob in there for about 24 hours to soak up all the salt. And then as they're sitting on these wooden boards, the salt's getting closer and closer to the center. 
Um, and the whole idea is getting it to the center in time before any spoilage happens, right? We talk all the time about how uh, cheese is controlled spoilage or milks leap towards their mortality. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the wine real quick and then we're gonna keep talking about this mountain idea and move to cheese too. Um, I think these wines are gonna be really interesting and highlight this idea of, you know, when we talk about pairings, we always talk about complementary versus contrasting flavors, right? Uh, and it's exactly what it sounds like. A contrasting flavor might be having something like this pairing with the white, I think is contrasting. You have so much fat in the Ponte and then the acid of the white really cuts right through. So that I'm gonna call a contrasting flavor uh, or pairing. Why don't you guys go ahead and try that with me? Mm. Um, and then a complementary flavor you know, it's not so much going to be the Conte. I think when we get to cheese two with the red, you're going to start seeing more of a complementary idea. But it's this idea that we're highlighting something by the sameness, right? So the Gruyere, we'll talk about fruitiness. And I think it really brings out the fruitiness of the wine. And, and that's more complementary. I don't get so much fruitiness in the Conte. As I mentioned earlier, I'm really into like the brown butter notes and the hazelnut notes. I don't have that in this wine. And so it's hard to find a complimentary example, but I encourage you whenever I taste everything, you know, I try everything by itself first, and then I go ahead and do the head to head with the two, two wines. In terms of practical, I always have a little cheese in my mouth. I take a couple chews and then I add the wine and do a little swirling. It's not the prettiest idea, but when we're talking about pairings and I'm giving you guys suggestions, I really need to road test them. So it's not just eating and drinking um, in alternating methods because, you know, everybody, everything tastes good if you're eating and drinking and just enjoying yourself. It's about kind of doing the slurry, if you will. Um, did anybody have any favorites? Did anything jump out between those two wines and the cheese? Is that we, like the, okay. we like the white with it. Um, yeah. Not... Uh... I don't know that we'd normally be predisposed towards white wines, but, but it, I don't know. I mean, they're both, but yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'm glad you liked it. I, I think this white, you know, I mentioned earlier that I really, I'm partial to this white. I think Pinot Grigio, like I said, is always so kind of, eh, it's high acid, it's clean, it's not, it's no, not offensive, but I really love in this white, I get a lot of um, herbaceous qualities almost. There's mm -hmm. almost like a hint of mentholiptus or, uh, or eucalyptus. Uh, but mostly it's the stone fruit and like lemon curd kind of things. And I think that it's so bright that it kind of lightens up all these really dense cheeses we're about to go through. So I think you guys are going to enjoy the white throughout the night. Yeah, we are already. Good, good. Um, okay, guys, let's go over to Gruyere. Um, you know, for many, many years, I forget the year, I think it was the early 2000s where it became illegal to actually refer to this this way. Conté was often sold as Conté de Gruyère. We still see it in plenty of our lists, but it's not allowed to be officially referred to that. Um, the EU squashed that idea. But I, I mention this because I like to just remind everybody, it's the same problem everywhere on the mountains, and it's all about solving that problem, right? These guys are all coming to the, a different solution or a similar solution to the same problem. That problem is that when I'm up in the Alps, it's beautiful in the summer, you know, the hills are alive with the sound of music and smell of cheeses. Um, you have these lush whole green grasses and it's a great source of free feed, right? I bring my cows up and I follow the snow melt. It's a over a thousand year tradition called transhumanism, this idea of following the snow up. Um, and then I live the summer up there and I have all this excess of resources because of a lot of grass and my cows are happy. You're talking about very small herds because I have to be nimble enough to go up the hill and manage them. So compared to like our American standard herd, tiny, tiny, something like 15 to 60 cows. Um, and then in the winter, it's going to, winter is coming, right? Uh, to steal a catchphrase. It's going to be a harsh winter at the top of the Alps. And so I need to get down into that valley. Once I'm in the valley, I can't grow any crops. Um, I don't really have any resources for the winter except for cold and snow, cold and snow. And so what am I gonna do to survive? Doing something like killing my little cow friend here, that really changes next year. I have one less cow. Um, and so it's a major decision, bigger than I think we 
recognize in our modern grocery buying life that like eating meat has big repercussions. And so uh, what do you do? You make a really large wheel of cheese and that's going to help us survive this rough, rough winter. And so in the village of Comte, they're making Comte and in the village of Gruyere, they're making Gruyere and they're very similar cheeses. Um, the same cows are designated for them. Um, yeah, it, they're, they're made in the same idea, this curd, this hot pressed curd and brine salted. But I think that this is where you really get to discuss terroir. And I hope that you guys will taste it in a way that when we're talking about it abstractly, it's hard to kind of get the idea. And terroir is this taste of place. So what's the difference between, you know, a couple hundred kilometers? And we're going to really zone in on this on the second half of our tasting. Um, if we're doing the same idea, the same practice, shouldn't it taste the same? And I think that while you have very similar textures and similar ideas, you get really different flavors from these two cheeses. Um, you know, if I had a handy dandy little flavor wheel, I think we're in a different quadrant of the wheel, right? Um, so I'm going ahead and I'm pressing mine to warm it up a little bit because I actually missed my hour deadline of pulling my cheeses out. Um, but to me, this cheese is way less of that low brown butter note. It's still there. There's still a lot of creaminess, but I start getting a little more animal and a little more fruitiness in this cheese. Um, you know, Gruyere is one of the most famous cheeses in the world. When I was doing my research, several things alluded to it being the number one cookbook cheese in all of uh, history. I think that, you know, many of the mongers would kind of uh, relate to this. Often people come in and they're like, I need a Gruyere. And it's like, do you, do you know what you're asking for? Do you just need a mountain cheese? Or like, you have your heart set on Gruyere. Um, you know, similar Gorgonzola is often cited as a specific blue cheese um, that recipes have. And I think that most often you can dissect it and find the right cheese, but Gruyere is really often mentioned by name. It's a cheese that has a lot of history and, you know, that's because of a story of the Swiss Cheese Consortium. Um, there's a great Planet Money and uh, Benji is going to put it in the chat if anybody wants to find it and, uh, you know, tag it for later. But there's a really great Planet Money where they talk about the history of the Swiss Cheese Consortium. So in Switzerland, cheese is big money, right? We know Swiss cheese. I mean, we even call Emmentaler just by that name, Swiss cheese. Um, the strategy in the Swiss government was to focus on four cheeses. Does anybody have a question? Okay, so we're focusing on just four cheeses. We're not doing what France does in highlighting this beautiful cornucopia of cheeses we make. We're just gonna focus on the big ones. We're gonna focus on Gruyere, Emmentaler, Stillsitzer, and Appenzeller. And if I want to make a subsidy, if I want to get any kind of benefit of the infrastructure of our cheese community, I have to be making these four cheeses. And, and for generations, the consortium both helped promote these cheeses and create infrastructure and trade routes and this and that, um, but it also created standards and regulations around the cheese. And so if you are making a cheese that's under the consortium guides, you sell your cheese to the consortium, the consortium uh, sells it to the people. And there's a whole grading process that goes into it. It's a really fascinating idea. Um, and when we get to the second half of our tasting, it's going to be all about the consortium collapsing and all these young cheesemongers coming or cheese makers coming out with their own products. But for most of our lives, that's how we've kind of known Swiss cheese. You didn't see random Swiss cheeses in the market really until about 10, 15 years ago when that falls apart. And in fact, fondue is, uh, you know, we think about it as this like very traditional Swiss dish, but it really came out in like the mid 60s when there was a surplus of Swiss cheese and the consortium had to figure out what to do. Well, they promoted the idea of taking a whole bunch of their Swiss cheeses and melting them together. A little bit of Emmentaler and Gruyere if you want a milder one, or if you want a really spicy, big fondue, go ahead and do the Gruyere with an Appenzeller or the Stillsitzer, or bigger cheeses. Um, and so uh, the reason why all of our, you know, many of the baby boomers were all gifted fondue sets with their weddings is because the Swiss government, the consortium was very actively trying to sell down a surplus at that time. Um, and I just always love when like global politics and reality kind of intertwines into the, the market of specialty goods. And this is no, no different. Um, so 
So let's go ahead and try the Gruyere with the wine. Same idea. Go ahead and make sure you really have gotten a sense of this Gruyere and then try it with the two different wines. And I think now you'll get what I was talking about when I talked about complementary. Those fruitier flavors of the Gruyere are going to come out from the Schiava. Um, I get a really cool plum note on the Schiava, and I'm curious if it's going to play through on the Gruyere. Benji, have we had any questions so far? Uh, one question, what is, uh, so you mentioned, you know, Gruyere is often a cooking cheese. What is some recipes that you would recommend using a Gruyere for? So it's a great question. And I think that I mention it more because I think any recipe that called for Gruyere, most of these cheeses would work. And as we delve through the cheeses, you know, you could decide oh, this recipe called for Gruyere, but I actually think the Comte would be a little milder and nicer. Um, and I don't mean to not answer the question. I will give you a proper answer. But I think that that's the cool thing is once you understand why they said Gruyere because of the meltability, then you can play with it more. Um, my favorite Gruyere thing is Gougères. Gougères are um, the same pastry dough as uh, eclairs. It's like pas de choux is the name of the dough. And you bake a little... Gruyere into that pot of choux dough and you have these little cheesy puffs called gougères and I could eat them by like a 10 sack. I love gougères. Um, Will makes a really good comté gratin. I always love it and I like switching it for out blossom during the spring because you got this herbaceousness but those are kind of the dishes we're talking about and you know Gruyere would be French onion soup would either be a comté French uh, but the Swiss equivalent would be Gruyere. And I think most of the time in a restaurant in America, you're actually eating Gruyere on your French onion soup. Very few restaurants are buying Comte. Um, yeah, yeah, certainly in a restaurant. Can you tell me again the name of the, uh, of, of the pastry that you... Uh, yeah, so the, the, the final dish is called Gougere. Um, I can't spell to save my life. <laughs> so maybe somebody e could Google it. Uh, yeah, Gougere. <laughs> Um, we'll and, it. and type it in. I see Will typing, so hopefully he's making it happen for us. Okay. Um, so we'll check but that yeah, out. Gougères. And then pas de choux is the actual dough. Um, because, you know, in culinary world, everything's like these base recipes, at least in French cooking. So the base dough is pas de choux, um, which is spelled even weirder. I Got know it. that. Yeah. Um, um, you're right that I'm interrupting by asking this by phone, or should I be typing my questions? You're great. You're great. It gets quiet when it's just me talking. Okay. And so I, I appreciate sure. you answering the call when I'm like, yeah. anybody else? It was there? admonishing me a little bit because I wasn't typing and I wanted to know if I was busting the rules here. So you're great. Right, thank you. There are no rules at cheese tasting. Um, <laughs> we, do, we do have another question. Um, yes. Do you, what is, uh, do you like any of the rinds on any of these cheeses? Um, or what, what is your kind of theory on that for these? Elsewhere? Yeah. So you'll see, depending on where your pieces are coming from, some of them have paper on them. None of them are gonna have any plastic or wax or anything dangerous. Um, and even the paper is very thin and they're gonna be using soy eats. So you can eat everything you want. I personally don't love these rinds. Um, they're what in the cheese world we would call a natural rind, which just means, like I said, it, it's natural. There's no uh, adhesive or wax. And it's just cheese being exposed to the elements. Um, part of the reason it seals up so dry is because of the brine idea, right? It's sitting in the brine, so it gets a really nice helicolor skin in that initial uh, soaking. And then that kind of just goes moldy and fuzzy as it sits there for a year or eight months. Um, a lot of cheesemongers love them. A lot of people who like rinds like these rinds. Um, for something like the Conte and the Gruyere, they do a really good job of keeping these cheeses very clean, relatively speaking. Most of these cheeses actually utilize cheese flipping robots. And as I say that sentence, I'm so disappointed I didn't like load the YouTube clip. Um, but there are robots that are going through these aisles and cheese caves and actually scanning the rinds, brushing them, giving them that quarter turn and a flip. Um, because these cheeses hang out in the case of Comte and Gruyere, sometimes for two plus years in these forts. And so there's a lot of little micro movements they need to do in order to age evenly. Um, Whenever I'm trying to assess if I want to eat a rind, what I would do is I cut myself a nice piece where I have the rind on one side, but not on the other side, and I'm going to eat towards the rind. And if I like the piece just beneath the rind, everything tastes good to me, 
I'm going to go ahead and try the rind. And for anybody who's a little more adventurous or who knows they like rinds, I encourage you to try it. And if Zach, um, if you want me to show the video, I, I do have uh, the, the flipping robots uh, pulled up. So I'll... Uh, please, please. I'll, I, I will share that real quick. Um, but yeah, this rind, you know, it just adds more kind of caviness and, and intensity. Excuse me. So this is a cheese flipping robot. The, the most common injury in a cheese facility is shoulder injuries. Um, so you can see that that, that really shaves a lot of, saves a lot of shoulder injuries. Many of the American facilities that are really aiming at growth and kind of commercial viability, like Jasper Hill Cellars, they actually built their caves to the specifications of those Swiss robots. So one day they get big enough, they can actually get these things to flip for them. Um, but yeah, all cheesemongers all have rotator cuff and shoulder issues. So, or cheese makers, not mongers. So cheese flipping robots, they're, they're serious. What other questions do we have? Um, you mentioned aging earlier uh, in terms of the brining and all that stuff. Is there a specific age for a normal mountain cheese or, or what's that? And I know there's like baby Swiss to all sorts yeah. of. So it's a great question. There, there's not in the sense that they, they have that huge range. Like Benji mentioned, you can get some really young, young cheeses like a Newfoundland or a young Emmentaler all the way up to two years. But I would say you don't really find under three months. You know, it needs to have enough time to at least set up um, and get salt into the middle of the cheese. And by virtue of the needs of those communities, you're not making a lot of these tiny little delicate cheeses except for during the height of summer. You know, there's a, a whole category of cheeses that we're just never going to have, right? Yogurts and small little lactic set cheeses that the villages are going to eat, but they make no sense to ship them. Um, and so they're shipping their big hearty cheeses, and that's why those are the ones we know about more. Um, yeah, but they're, they're definitely, I'd say for the Comte, we're sitting at around 14 months, 12 months, somewhere in that range. And for the Gruyere, we're probably in about 14 to 18 months. Um, and we'll talk about the other two when we get there, but they're going to be a little younger because they're smaller, right? Both of the first two cheeses are in the very old school traditional sense of how to make these mountain cheeses. So they're 80 pound wheels um, and, you know, about this tall in diameter. So it's a very large circle um, or this exactly. thickness. Exactly. Yeah. One other question, if I might, between Please. the Conte and the, and the uh, Gruyere. So you mentioned that there's a few hundred kilometers that separate them too, and that they're aged, uh, uh, you know, aged a uh, similar amount of time. Presumably yeah. some, I mean, there's got to be some different other different elements to the recipes there. Like it isn't, it isn't just the difference in, you know, cows being 300 kilometers apart, I, I would imagine, or is it, I, I'm just curious, is, are they made differently or what, what else? They're made generally the same way. Uh, you know, cheese recipes are very different than, um, you know, a soup recipe because it's a lot of it is this interaction of time and at acidification. And so when um, the milk is ready for, when it goes from that initial acidification, then you're ready for the rennet and then the acid arc that they let before they start draining water. Those are things that even if I knew them, I wouldn't understand them. You know, sure. like that's, that's, and so I, I'm certain that there's differences in there. Um, but in terms of like the really, the core ideas, there's not a whole lot of difference. Both of these cheeses are never going to be uh, made from milk that's been cooled. You're going to take milk from the field if it's, um, you milk twice a day. And so the winter milk is going to be acidified by the morning and that's going to help start this process. So I'm going to take last night's acidified milk that's just kind of been chilling at room temperature and the brand new milk that's at the body temperature of the cow and start making cheese. Um, it's all raw milk and I'm going to use a copper line vat and do this hot pressed cheese process and then age on wood boards. And so like all these bullet points are similar, um, but there's an incredible amount of difference I think in those small little acidifications and uh, you know, what the cows are eating and what the difference in altitude is and, and all of that makes a real difference. Um, yeah. For a follow up and then I'll, I'll quit asking questions, but 
for a minute. Right. Anyway. But the uh, the Pleasant Ridge Reserve in Wisconsin that you mentioned is that did they? I mean, other than the difference in altitude and the like, is it made in a similar fashion? Yeah. So he so Andy is copying a Beaufort recipe. Uh, B e a u f o r t Beaufort. Um, and Beaufort is the same concept, but coming from the Auvergne, so a little bit more central in France, a little more west than the Jura, um, and just another mountain range. And so, yeah, he's totally taking these same ideas, and he's tweaking it to the nuances of that recipe. Um, and one of the only hallmarks that's really different between that and these is Beaufort is considered the most dense cheese in all of the world. It's the, mm-hmm. the most savory and like uh, its chew is supposed to mimic something like a steak. They press it the most, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, they're, they're really, it's amazing that you can take these high level same recipes and get a myriad of differences. And it's really going to be highlighted by the next two cheeses. Um, right. One thing I realized I kind of skipped over with Comte that I wanted to mention is you know, Comte is the number one eaten cheese in France. Uh, I know it's not so familiar to us Americans, but I think it kind of goes back to Benji's comment about the aging. You can have Comte that you find even in America at Trader Joe's that's really young, and it's going to eat much more like that Swiss Emmental, the big holes. Um, or you can have Comte that's two plus years old and is going to be, you know, the unicorn cheese of any cheese shop in the world, not just, you know, France. Um, and they do a fantastic job in both of these facilities of selecting, right? So much of what happens and what makes these cheeses cool is the selection. And so even within the cheese itself, you have so much variation. No one wheel is alike because it's a different part of the field and a different cow and a different collection. Um, There are also really large networks that make these cheeses. They all fall under what's called a village cooperative system. So, you know, hundreds of family farms pooling their milk together, making a cheese, and the whole village survives this way. Um, you could kind of think of Detroit as a auto village cooperative, right? So many people work in the auto industry in some capacity. Um, and just like that, in these villages, so many people work in the cheese uh, in some capacity. So there's a chef de cave in both of these cases, a, a person who can stare at 100,000 wheels of Comte and be like, oh, you need this one. Um, and it's all these little nuances. Um, I think that listening to people describe Conte in the Conte world is so fascinating. Even from my very first tasting of Conte, I remember sitting listening to these tasting notes and being like, what is she eating? She's tasting about tasting like jam and graphite and grass and chamomile. And I'm just like, this is tasty cheese. Um, and, and I've been trying to catch up to Daphne Zeppos my entire life, who was the woman who brought this into America the first time. And I had the privilege of first seeing Conte through the, her lens. Um, but yeah, they're amazing nuanced cheese, both categories. And I think they're really cool. Um, Thank you. Anybody have any questions before we move to a, we've been doing this kind of like 100 kilometer discussion and we're going to go zoom really close into a specific area in Switzerland and talk about two cheeses that are eight kilometers apart. So next door neighbors. We do have one more quick question. We'll answer it in the chat, but it would be interesting to see if you have a different answer as well as as well for this one. So it was asked for those of us that might travel to the Alpine region and have the opportunity to taste the less hearty, durable cheeses of the region. Is there one that they're most proud of or is a must try? Yeah, for sure. Um, Did he say Vacheron Mandor? Was that his answer? He did not. He said Stancer Flata. I don't even know that one. So Vashra Mandor is a really um, famous cheese from that region. And it is back to this idea of uh, American cheeses mimicking these cheeses. So Harbison or um, Rush Creek Reserve are both Vashra inspired cheeses. So Vashra is like a slightly taller than a camembert. And it's so soft that you have to give it a little wooden belt. And um, it gets super wild. It's actually, I'm reading a great book about the history of uh, the regulations around cheese. And it was a cheese that was almost like wiped off the face of this earth because of a Listeria breakout of the 90s. But Vatra Mandor is very cool. And you, you can't get it in the United States because it'd be raw milk and under 60 days. So yeah, those are two, che- that, that is the cheese that I would look for if I was in that region. Um, yeah, I, I actually was mentioning the uh, Stanzer Flotta in reference to the question about like age of these different Alpine cheeses and that being one that's much on the younger side. And uh, I, I, I posted that right at the same time Jameson asked about 
the less durable cheeses. Um, I would have said uh, Vacher Montor first, but uh, it, I was reading about it the other night and Stanzer Flotta was actually created because I think in the, in the 90s, um, early 90s, there was such a shortage of Vacher Montor that they started coming up with some other recipes that were a little newer. Um, and Stanzer Flotta was one of them. And unlike Vacher Montor or Harbison or Rush Creek Reserve, if you've had any of those, um, Stanzer Flotta doesn't actually have like that band right around the outside, but they serve it in a wood, it, it's shipped in a wood box rather than having the band wrapped around it. Oh, that's cool. I can only imagine that gets super messy. You tried it. Do you remember trying it? My, oh, my cousin, that? my Swiss, I, so I have a Swiss, a cousin who lives in Switzerland. She's not Swiss, um, but she smuggled some in a year or two ago when she came home for Christmas. And uh, it was wild. I mean, we've tried numerous cheeses that are based on that recipe. And Stanzer Flotta kind of tasted like if you took cheese and made it with a soft, made it into like a soft crab dip. Like I've never had a cheese taste so reminiscent of uh, crustaceans as this. Um, really, really interesting cheese. Not, you know, not for everyone and way more intense than Harbison, which a lot of people love and a lot of people think is too intense in the United States, but um, very funky. You know, yeah, I was gonna say I remember uh, sea urchin was the flavor note I kept coming to mind. Um, awesome. So, friends, we're gonna take a short plane ride to a specific region within Switzerland and talk about these two cheeses. So we're in the Appenzeller area of the Alps, um, and uh, both of the Schneebelhorn and Hollerhocker they're coming to us from a, a really great importer called Columbia Cheese. Um, Columbia Cheese is started by Adam Moskowitz and um, I'm going to kind of tell both stories at once because they really had a similar experience. Um, so uh, this one is Schneebelhorn and this is coming from a gentleman with the uh, name of Gutensberg, which is also another cheese that he makes and their family second or third generation Appenzeller makers and when the Swiss Cheese Consortium starts to have issues um, they start to get really frustrated with this and they decide they want to break out, right? They had a different reason than Walter Ross that we'll talk about in a second. For them, it was a lot of the, the frustration and the, the uh, kind of the pacing of getting cash in hand and things like this, right? I have to sell it to the consortium. The consortium has to sell it to the consumer. I get paid whenever. They didn't like this. And so they decided to start restructuring their situation. And they, um, they, took what their, was their grandfather's cheese making facility. He moved into that as his personal home. So he, he lives only a couple feet away from his grandfather's cheese making vat. Um, so he really lives in his own personal history. And then they put up a creamery a little bit more north in the mountains. And so this is another kind of this village cooperative system, but this is one family utilizing their own village. So it's a, about 50 herds that are, um, supplying this company and they use the lower herds and i mean lower by altitude not by quality and that is all for oppenzeller right so 75 percent of the milk oppenzeller and then the higher by altitude milk gets made in the schneebel um so they're still using some of their shares and all these shares <coughs> is the amount that you're allowed to make right i can only make x amount of oppenzeller they don't want big business coming in and kind of crushing out everybody. So each family gets X amount of shares. And so they've, with their brother and their father and all these generations, they pool their shares and they've really started to strategically make other milk. They're not just relying on Oppenzeller and they're not just playing that game. They're making their own cheeses. And Adam Moskowitz and Columbia Cheese, they really made that promise to these producers. You know, they, um, they pedal in the esoteric mountain cheeses. That's really Columbia's feature. And they promised that the American market would help um, usher in this new era of Swiss cheese. And so uh, a lot of the things that I've really enjoyed doing in my cheese career were kind of uh, through this lens in the sense that 
the cheesemonger and the tational is the same gentleman from Columbia Cheese. Um, and so they're always big sponsors of the Cheesemonger Invitational, which is an awesome competition where cheesemongers battle in wits and tastes and all this craziness. Um, somebody once described it as WrestleMania meets cheese. Um, it's a very silly competition. But in 2014, I got second place, and that really launched my career. And so um, these are really near and dear to my heart in that sense. And Adam's done a really great job of expanding everybody's vision past those four cheeses I talked about early. And so um, in the case of Schneebelhorn, once you all of a sudden have kind of lost the shackles of making Oppenzeller, and I don't have to make it this very specific way, uh, what this cheesemaker decided to start doing was adding cream. And so for anybody who's been playing along in the, the, the silly putty Play-Doh game, you really feel it when you play with this cheese. It, it's a totally different texture. Um, this cheese is about eight months old, so it's younger than anything we've tasted, and it's added cream, so it has a lot more fat. And in fact, with a lot of these mountain cheeses, they partially skim them, right? Um, fat is the more volatile kind of element in, in aging. Fat's where you get a lot of flavor, but it's also where things can get weird. And so a lot of cheesemakers will take fat out for really aged cheeses. But the fact that these are only about 20 pounds, um, and they're usually aged under a year, they, they could be a lot higher fat cheeses. Mm. I love the texture of Schneebelhorn. I sometimes forget about how wonderful it is, but uh, it really just has such a fun texture. Um, the cows in this case are mostly brown Swiss and uh, brown thigh is the German name for this other herd um, or other breed. And so it's a different, you know, for the first two cheeses, we're really talking about Montpellier cows and um, Sentinel, uh, these two specific breeds that are really common in Gruyere and Comté. And we're actually switching, and both of these producers are using the same cow. So it, it's, it was a fun matchup, how, how the cheeses worked. They ended up being very specific flights in my mind. Um, Schneebelhorn, I think with all that fat, you know, back to this idea of recipes, it's going to melt much faster. And so you could use it in, you know, dishes that don't require the same amount of baking. This is a cheese that's going to be a great grilled cheese cheese, right? I don't need to like bake a whole casserole, but a little bit of heat and this is going to melt very fast. It's also going to be a fantastic mac and cheese. Uh, that, that velvety texture is just going to be fun. And with pairings, it's really going to lend itself to some of that higher acid. So if we go back to the Pinot Grigio, I think it's going to be <clears throat> really nice because all that added fat is going to need a little bit of extra acid to cut through it. So when we're evaluating taste and pairings at Mongers, you know, we use a specific kind of range. Uh, you can always talk about how much you like a product, one through 10, that's easy. But you kind of require more language when you talk about the dynamic interplay between, you know, pairings. And so back to Daphne. Daphne taught us this idea when I did this amazing event with her at Zingerman's when I was a young cheesemonger. Um, and Daphne outlined this idea of a, a negative two to positive three tasting. And so negative twos are when I'm brushing my teeth and I have a big glass of orange juice, all of a sudden everything clashes. It's a negative two. Um, a negative one I think happens when you're grazing through a bunch of different foods and you're drinking your wine. All of a sudden you eat something, you go back to your wine, Blah, super metallic right? The wine was tainted from something. That's a negative one. Um, a zero, I think, is most food situations. Most of the time we're eating, we're sitting on the couch, you're kind of going back and forth, there's not a lot of information going on. Um, or sometimes foods just don't interact in this romantic way, and so there is zero. A positive one is if I'm cooking tomato sauce, I add a little red wine, all of a sudden my tomato sauce is perfect. I didn't really do any favors for the wine, though positive one. A positive two is maybe one of these interactions that you've had where, you know, you tasted the cheese and maybe you thought it was a little too much, a little too much barnyard in it. And then you went with the wine and that acid and that like, uh, you know, that lemon pit flavor is kind of cut through the animaliness and kind of the saltiness of the cheese came out more and the acid cuts through the fat, and then maybe the wine was a little too harsh, but the, the extra fat helps mild out the wine. Everything's kind of elevated and a little more symbiotic, 
it's a positive two. Everything's kind of been made better. And then the positive threes, they're really rare. Um, I like to call it the peanut butter and jelly effect, right? All of a sudden, the sum are better than the parts. This is how we should taste this from now on. You should always be eating, you know, stilted with pork. Um, you should always be having foie gras and saltarin. And, uh, you know, the reason I mention those random pairings is because I think they're really, they're random. They're, uh, they're, they're the pairings that we remember in history because pairing wine and cheese or wine and things is really difficult. Wine is harder than beer. I think beer is a, a more friendly thing with pairings. And, you know, those classic pairings uh, echo through the ages because they're so unique and so delicious. Yeah. If anybody finds a positive three tonight, please let us know. Any questions, Benji? Nothing right now. Nothing right now. Okay. All right, guys. We're going to go from Schneebelhorn down to Tuflichville. Um, to holler hopper. Sorry for coming in late here, but like, you're, what, are you're your, what are some of your favorite combinations that are at like the far right bookend? Like you, you know. With the wine? <laughs> That's like far right, you doofus. What do you, what do you mean um, by far right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly what Katie just said too. Everything's a punchline. She's the one that asked about why didn't the robot have googly eyes too. It wasn't me, just for the record. Um, the uh, um, yeah, like what favorite com favorite combinations of cheeses and other things that are like the, just out of this world, like corn yeah. nuts and. <laughs> I got you. I got you. Yeah, actually, corn nuts sound great with all of these, but yeah, uh, because y'all's are delicious. Yeah, dude, Kikos, they're serious. So perfect timing because we're going to transition to holler hawker and holler hawker. Um, I really like it with peanut butter. It's not something I would necessarily think of, but um, I get to judge the cheese my gravitational because I did well enough back then. And so there was a, it was on a corn chip with a spicy peanut butter and um, holler hocker all on one bite. And it was insane and really tasty. Um, it had kind of, if anybody's ever had like the kimchi and peanut butter and burger type of combination of flavors that gets really weird, but awesome. Uh, it had some of that going on. Hollerhocker is, and, and please use this as an invitation to try this cheese. Hollerhocker is a weird and awesome cheese and it has the rind to match it. Uh, I was excited to show you this and I hope that the glare of the plastic wrap doesn't ruin it. Yeah. No. Perfect. <laughs> the Hollerhockers. So Hollerhocker is a, Swiss legend uh, that the youngest kid, and I take this with a, a stride as the baby of the family, was too simple to do anything in the chores <laughs> without messing it up. And so you're in charge of watching the cheese age. That's your job. And that's a holler hawker, that seller watcher. Uh, Walter Ross's neighbor went ahead and drew his, uh, his seller watcher and the holler hawker kid was born. Um, in the world of nerdy cheesemongers, because that is a, it is a word, world beyond myself, uh, holler hocker is really common and popular. And so um, you'll see people print out little holler hocker masks around Halloween if you're like a cheese shop in Brooklyn. Um, holler hocker is awesome. Holler for holler hocker. It, it's so much flavor. It's mind blowing. It's one of those cheeses that to me really kind of shows that you can of course, taste all these nutty, lactic things we expect. But with age and with the rind conditioning, um, you can also taste like savory and almost meaty notes. I get a lot of bone broth and kind of wilder, almost game flavors from this cheese. Um, it's awesome. And it holds up to something as intense as peanut butter. Peanut butter is really an intense flavor. If you have ever talked to someone who grew up in a culture where peanut butter did not exist, um, it's one of the things they often mention that like when I came to America, I was like, what do you guys keep doing with this? It's really creamy, dense and flavorful. And so to match with peanut butter, you need something that's really intense. I mean, if you think of jelly, uh, a lot of sugar, a lot of acid, that's how it holds up. And this cheese, instead of being contrasting, kind of to use the language she talked about earlier, you know, this is more complimentary. It's that same fudginess and intensity of peanut butter and then, you know, salt and it's crazy. Um, holler hockers are really fun cheese in the sense that each wheel gives you so much flavor and it goes in different directions. You almost get fish sauce in some of these. Um, 
And when you play with it with the wine, you're going to get different things. So this is, I think, where the Schiava is going to really start to shine. And um, I think this is a great example of how, you know, there's, in a lot of what we do, right, there's, there's the influence of terroir, the place, and the influence of the maker. We talk a lot of, about it in wine. We talk about it in chocolate. In this case, uh, the place where Hollerhocker is made and the place where Schneebelhorn is made, it's an eight minute drive. Um, it's incredibly close. You know, uh, Zach, is Walter using Brown Swiss or is he using a different breed? So he is using Brown Swiss, but it's his own breed. So yep. instead of doing this cooperative, he's off the grid. It's all his. Yeah. I mean, so, so there's, there's similarities there, but he's obviously, you know, he's, he's doing his own alchemy and you're tasting these cheeses side by side. They're both similar breeds of cows. They're both coming from an area that, you know, I'm not an expert on the flora of that region of Switzerland, but just to take a guess, I'm, I'm going to venture that it's fairly close. Um, and the cheeses are very different. This particular wheel of Schneebelhorn, I would say, is a little bit more mild than what we're often used to. Um, but it's by no means a, a pushover uh, cheese. And it's, it's awesome to see the variation when people, you know, start playing with the different uh, inputs in this, in this process. Yeah. Um, to Eric's question earlier, there's a little more difference between these two recipes in the sense that Schneebelhorn is cream added. Walter is just not skimming his milk. Um, and so higher fat content, but really similar stuff. And then Walter's totally off the grid. He is making his own starter culture, his own rennet. It's his own milk. Um, but to Will's point, they're an eight minute drive apart. And I think a world of flavor apart in some ways. Um, you know, it's obviously not the same, it's not the same amount of difference between like a feta and this cheese, but within a category, you really have a lot of nuance and difference. And I think back to that original question of like, what do you use a Gruyere with? I would challenge you, what do you want to do in your dish, right? All these cheeses are going to accomplish that same meltability, that same overall flavor. And so do I want it to be like milder and creamier? Do I want it to be a kind of like fruitier and gamier. So I'm going to get a Gruyere. Do I want it to taste more of that like elegant brown butter flavors? Um, or do I want it to be wild and animally? All of those are going to answer and work in the, you know, gratin that I'm making or in the French onion soup. But I think that what I really wanted you guys to walk away with is, you know, when someone says use Fontina or use, uh, Gruyere that you take a moment and say, what else could I use that would still accomplish the same goals? Um, I think all cheeses, you know, they all have their own meltability and their own personality, but these are all one category that really work. Um, yeah. What questions do we have about mountain cheeses? So Zach, we do have someone who has taken your Hollerhocker and peanut butter to the next level. So Jameson recommends Hollerhocker, peanut butter, fig compote, and a little red wine. And he says it's unreal, but potentially a plus three even, you know, I, yeah, that's awesome. That sounds cool. Oh, I wanted to real quick, tell you the story of how Walter, I, I realized I skipped this. Why did he get into Oppenzeller production? Right. He wasn't trying to diversify. Um, Walter has a really cool story. Uh, he is very well known in his region and he is a extremely talented cheesemaker to the point where I mentioned the consortium tastes, right? And what they want you to do is make Gruyere or Oppenzeller. They don't care about if it's Walter's Oppenzeller or Bob's Oppenzeller. They want it to taste like Oppenzeller. And so Walter actually was getting graded down because you could tell it was him. It was so perfect and so of himself. There was a, a, a thumbprint or a, a taste of Walter, um, not to be crude, that came through in his cheeses. And the consortium was like, well, this is antithetical to the idea of the one cheese we're selling. Um, and so he started actually making less money off of his Oppenseller shares because the consortium was arguing that he was breaking away from the rest of the pack in his perfection. 
And that's when he was like, I, I can't play this game. I'm not going to make less because I'm doing a better job than everybody else and making a more pristine cheese. And so um, unlike Gutenberg family, where they're still doing Oppenzeller, Walter, I believe two years ago or a year ago, totally sold off all his shares to other members of his family. He committed all of his milk to Hollerhocker. And uh, the American market is a huge part of Hollerhocker's success. And we really allow uh, him to live this like life of a cheesemaker without the politics. Um, Will and I got to hang out with Walter in Chicago last year. He always likes to wear traditional uh, later hosen and such at these festivals, so you never miss him. Um, and he's just an amazing guy. And he like genuinely thanked us for, you know, selling his cheese and allowing it, his life to continue the way he wants it to. So um, I think sometimes we lose focus that the fact that like we support family farms, uh, even if they're really far away, it's still a small family farm. Uh, no one on like God's green earth is driving a Bentley from a family farm. It's a hard work. It's, it takes a lot of labor and it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a expression of both passion, but also like history, his family, his father before him and everybody did cheese in this region in the same way. And so he's continuing his tradition, but he actually got to, for the first time in multiple generations, put his thumbprint on that story and not just have it be another Swiss cheese from the consortium. Now he has his own original thing. So I think these are really cool stories in the mountain cheese. So we think of cheese as being somewhat of a static idea in the old world. And we think of all the fun new American cheeses, but we always come back to those classic, I want a Manchego, I want a Parmesan. And so um, while there's certainly nothing wrong with Comte all day or Gruyere, I think it's really cool to see what the last 20 years of Swiss cheese and ingenuity has brought. So um, those are the cheeses. Are we ready for some chocolate? Are we doing all right on time? We do have another question. Um, so oh, good. Suhail says, I always struggle to find the word to describe a flavor. The Hollerhocker is more pungent and tense to them. What is the cheesemonger word to describe that, needing to know the characteristic of how to ask for a cheese in the future? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so more pungent. Um, I mean, I think that you could definitely speak to intensity of flavor as its own thing, right? Um, I would say that there is, you know, more saltiness there is more funk, there is just some, it's more flavorful is a fair comment. In terms of what flavors you're talking about, um, you know, I really hang towards that bone broth flavor when I'm talking about meatier mountain cheeses. So if I was asking somebody for an Appenzeller um, or a Hokey Brig or something that's a little funkier, I would say meat. I also, um, I, I think when I talked about gaminess and fruitiness, uh, if I was to take it a step further, it, it to me is a lot of the smell of fermentation. Uh, has anybody ever been to wine country during harvest? I lived in Napa for a year, but there's a smell in the air of that early, just like fruit rotting. And it's not like bad smell. It's it's early fermentation. and And to me, the cheese gets a little bit of that like you know, grape juice just starting to go bad. Or um, I also think of leaves starting to decay, like when you're at fall, it's a similar smell of this like sweet decay. Um, and in Spain, they, they talk about this a lot. They call it harancio. It's a beautiful word for rancidity. Um, but these cheeses have that kind of gaminess. It's, it's amino acids being broken down into its smaller parts is, is a specifically, or I'm sorry, things being broken down into amino acids is what that smell and taste is. Um, it's the flavor of breakdown. Soy sauce is a really good example of that, like sweet, meaty funk, I think. Was that helpful or do people just think I'm crazy now? No, I mean, I, I think that Zach, that's a good way to put it. I mean, you're, you're kind of describing that umami profile, you know, and, um, Hollerhocker's loaded with it. Like I would call it a really big cheese, right? Whereas Comte is a incredibly complex cheese in a nuanced way. You know, Hollerhocker is, there's nuance there, but it's underneath the initial like shock and awe of the flavor profile. Um, you know, it's, it's big, it's pungent and it's, it's a, uh, you know, it's going to get your attention. I mean, and, and Walter has been able to sell a lot of it, probably largely because of Eric 
who's on the call tonight. I think he's responsible for at least 20% of domestic uh, consumption of Hollerhocker. And so, you know, Walter, thanks you. There you go. I love that. And I thank you guys and Walter. <laughs> um, is anybody ready for some chocolate? It's like you're yeah, that's great. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So, uh, we're going over to Belize. This is going to be the farthest trip we've taken all night. Um, no more into the Swiss uh, or into the Alps. We're into a whole other set of ranges and mountains. Uh, and Will reminded me in terms of altitude, we're dropping quite a bit, right? Maya Mountain Cooperative, which is where the cacao of this chocolate is grown, is, um, you know, mountainous to them. And you're talking about a factor of over a thousand feet from highest point to highest point, right? In the Alps, you're at like 4,900 feet. In um, the highest point of Belize, you're at 3,800 feet. So you've dropped quite a bit. And I believe that this cooperative is probably even at a lower point than the peak of the highest point of Belize. Um, Will, can you speak to the specifics of where the altitude is on this? Um, on this particular chocolate, uh, I don't know, ex you know, it's a co-op and they're, they're pulling cacao from a bunch of different small family farmers. Um, cool. But in general, cacao doesn't really grow much above a thousand feet above sea level, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, we're getting some of these cheeses like Schneebelhorn is named after the peak Schneebelhorn, which is about 4,000 feet above sea level. It's the highest peak in the canton of Zurich. You know, the highest point in the Alps is 15,000 feet. You could probably graze cows in good weather in the summer up, you know, on the upside of 10, 11,000 feet. I mean, if you've been out in Colorado, you might have seen cows at, at 10,000 feet above sea level, but you're not going to see a cacao tree at that elevation. Even, you know, even in Ecuador, when you're really close to the equator, like you won't see a cacao tree growing anywhere near um, Quito, which is 10,000 feet. You're not gonna see a cacao tree in, um, you know, Lima or uh, not Lima, but Cusco, you know, in Peru. And, and is that because you've gone past the tree line, right? This like reality of altitude you're, you're where trees don't grow. You're not past the tree line, but you're past the comfort range for that plant. Like, when, you know, yeah. once, for the same reason that you can't grow cacao in Southern Florida, it's just, it doesn't take being, you know, a few degrees too cold and your plant's not gonna fruit properly and you won't get good, you know, yield or the plant won't survive at all. So you don't, you don't have a lot of room for like days below, you know, 60, 55 degrees. And when you're, no matter how far, south you are or how close to the equator you are once you get above three or four thousand feet you know you start to get days even you know even at those latitudes that get down into the 40s and 50s um it happens yeah um so about this chocolate uh maya mountain cooperative is a collection like will said of over 350 small farms in the area and they've been around for over 10 years, they really helped put Belize on the map on the international chocolate world, right? Uh, you know, mongers to back up a little bit, how we focus on chocolate is this bean to bar, this craft chocolate. Um, Will's done a great job. He's our chief chocolate buyer, chief chocolate officer of curating this selection of uh, chocolates from around the world. And we really focus on origin, right? We want to talk about the bean to the bar, right? Where's the chocolate grown? The terroir, just like the discussions we just did about the cheese. What matters if I grew my beans in Belize or if I grew them in Madagascar or Ecuador or so on and so forth? Um, we have the largest selection in Michigan and I think in the Midwest of this expression. Um, we have over 30 cacao growing regions that you can explore. I was excited to see Cuba make it today. I hadn't noticed that we got a Cuba bar. Um, and chocolate grows 25 degrees north or south of the equator. And so while I can grow in Cuba, I can't grow in Southern Florida, like Will mentioned. And so, um, you know, just like cheese, chocolate is a really cool expression of all these different places. And we love that we get to talk about more of the world than we would normally get to, right? So much of cheese and wine happens in the Northern Hemisphere, a little bit in the Southern Hemisphere, but not a lot of good cheese in the equator, um, or at least not a lot of very uh, aged cheeses in the equator. And so we really love uh, that chocolate has become part of our 
company in it since day one. And it allows us just to talk about more of the world. Um, so Maya Mountain Cooperative uh, has won a lot of awards for their cacao. And it's a cooperative that you'll see their name on several different brands. If you're buying a really good chocolate in from Belize, from a company, uh, you know, in the craft chocolate world, there's a really high chance that it's coming from this cooperative. Uh, I've personally tasted probably, you know, four or so different chocolates from that region, uh, from that cooperative. Uh, they've won enough awards from the, uh, I'm trying to find the exact name of the, the award, the Cacao Excellence Award. Um, and they've won enough that it actually kind of catapulted them into uh, being considered one of the top 20 cacao growing regions internationally. You know, a lot of people ask when they are kind of met with our giant wall of chocolate, where's the best chocolate come from? And, you know, people will debate till they're blue in the face. And there are certain regions that are always going to be mentioned. And this is in that top 20 list. So uh, no matter who you're talking to, if they're talking about the, the nicest places, the best chocolate, this is in the conversation, which I think is really cool. Uh, the producers today is Letterpress. Letterpress is coming out of L.A., um, in classic hipster LA fashion, they own an antique letter press and they do their own packaging. Um, he, the, so husband and wife team, he was at DreamWorks actually. I was doing a little research and he had a cool career there and they got obsessed with chocolate and they totally, it took over their lives. They were making chocolate in their apartment. They were um, sourcing really small batches of beans and roasting and super nerdy and in 2016 it got beyond the apartment and they started renting a commercial kitchen in 2017 they got their own space um and you know i think it highlights so much of our chocolate and so much of this trend is is brand new right craft chocolate is uh you know conte has gone back since like 1200s uh craft chocolate is like 12 years old it's a very different idea and so most of our life, we talked about chocolate in a very much like a commodity. Um, you know, we all enjoyed chocolate, but where it came from, that wasn't the question. It was just being sourced from anywhere in the equator. And we at Mongers really like to change that. We want to talk about first where it comes from and the hard work of growing and fermenting and roasting cacao. And then we'll talk about who makes the cacao once they actually manufacture it. Um, I think this is a great example of, you know, while it's not, 4,000 feet in the air, I get a lot of flavors that I associate with altitude um, or, or at least this bigger flavors. I, I've always loved this chocolate. It's bright. Um, and when I say bright, I mean that it has like some good acidity. Um, and it's just for 70%, it always has a big impact. Kind of like to that holler hawker question. It's hard to put words to it, but it just tastes like the volume gets turned up a little. What do you guys think of this chocolate? Will, do you like this chocolate? Uh, hate it. Hate it. <laughs> no, we, we like it here. We, uh, and Katie's not usually a dark chocolate fan, but I think even you're liking this. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's really it's good. One of, it's one of my go-tos, especially when I want to taste something bright um, with solid acidity and, and fruit flavors. You know, the Belize from my mountain is always a good option. Um, and letterpress, they just, they make really good chocolate. The, the bars are smooth. If, you know, if that's your thing, some people like a nice gritty bar that's coarse, but letterpress is, um, you know, it's very refined and their flavors from region to region are, are distinct. And um, did they do stuff all over the world then, Will? I mean, I'm, I'm guessing letterpress does. Yeah, they source beans from anywhere, you know, Belize, they've got Sao Tome, they've got a couple other African- Ecuador. Countries. Ecuador, um, Peru. So they have a they have a, a nice lineup. Yeah, it's really, I, I don't know, we really like it. And it's, good, it's good with the cheese and good with the wine too. They, they, so they, do some, they do some really good flavor bars too. You know, they're not a, they're not a one trick pony. Um, they're mint. They do a, a Ghanaian cacao with some mint um, flavor in it. And it's, it's like the most refined adult version of an Andes bar you, can, you could get. 
Yeah, yeah, and I, and I really love their uh, the molds they're using. I think that's new. I don't remember them having this detail, but it's such a beautiful picture. They they recreated their letterpress right onto the bar. Um, Can I see it? Yeah. I must I must have got an old version. Yeah, that is new to me. You okay, know, I'm glad to hear that. I, I was like opening a standard um, a square profile, you know, like. They're moving up in the world. One of the molds, it's just a grid. And I also have always loved this packaging. It's one of the things that always pops out the most. Um, this is from Peru, I believe, right? The Ucali Valley? Yeah. No. And this is one of our, um, you know, We're having either of those. we have a handful of chocolates that really get up there in price where you start talking about sourcing chocolate in such a specific way that it's, it's much more akin to the conversation around wine. We're no longer saying, you know, even this conversation where we're talking about specifically what growing farm, but there's still 350 farms that makes up this. Um, but with wine, it's just like, you know, California red's going to be the cheapest. Napa red's going to be a little more expensive. And then like Bob's vineyard in this part of Napa is going to be the most expensive. And, you know, this is the same idea where they're telling you exactly what valley and Peru the cacao is coming from. Um, and it has that beautiful like Versace packaging. So this is a, this is the high end of chocolate. It's a really fun bar to treat yourself every once in a while. But you really, when you try it, it's a, I always think chocolate of that caliber tells you a story. And what I mean by that is, you know, we talked about this chocolate being really bright and having that great like raisin flavor. And it has a nice long finish. I feel like these chocolates start somewhere and go on a couple different detours before you get that long finish. Um, if you ever are in the mood to treat yourself, you had a bad day, try a $20 chocolate bar. It, will, it, it really is a, a shockingly different kind of experience, much more like a fancy wine. Uh, we did have a mention that the chocolate with the schneebel horn really uh, beautifully counteracts the bitter characteristics and is a great combo. A, co a couple of people have mentioned kind of the chocolate cheese pairings that have uh, really yeah. blossomed here. I love that. I always uh, find myself at the end of these tastings taking the creamiest cheese and smashing them up with the chocolate. Uh, part of it's because of my love of milk chocolate. Um, so I try to create my own, but I love the idea of Schneebelhorn in this. I'm going to try it myself right now. Any other questions, Benji? Uh, no questions right now. I think people are just taking, taking it all in. Mm. Whoever came up with that, thank you. That is delicious. It's Jameson again, who seems to be on a, on a tear with the with the pairings. Who was it? Jameson. Jameson, my man. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Um, I'm curious, and I, I know that often we don't like to call favorites and things like that, but I would really love to hear either in the chat or if people want to raise their hand, what stood out to them tonight? What cheese was their favorite? Um, I can honestly say that I'm surprised at what really stood out to me and what was my favorite. Uh, but I would like to hear from you guys before I tell you what I thought. Did anybody have one cheese that was the best to them? Or the chocolate. That can also have won the show or a wine. I, no worries the, either way. The Schnibbelhorn, if I'm saying that right, was a new from yeah. <laughs> Come on. Schnibbelhorn. I think a bunch of it was new to us, uh, and I think we both really liked it. So um, yeah, it was it, because it was new. I mean, the other ones we've bought many, many times, and we love them. Many times. Um, and uh, but that that was delicious, and the chocolate was exceptional too. So thank thank you for both. Yeah. Mm hmm. Anybody else? We do have a vote for Holler Hawker in the chat. Uh, totally new for for Liz as well. So she loved it. Um. For me, Don't it was Schneebelhorn. Don't speak at once, everybody. I, I this is not this is past fail. So you just you know, give us give us a give us something. You can also a, take your pieces and rate them by how much is left. As I'm trying to show you a little. Yeah, that's, that's a great way to do it. So for me, I, I usually can't keep my hands off of Conte. Um, my wife will tell you that when we got our first wheel of Conte and I started to describe it, I literally broke into tears. Um, I love Conte, but Schneebelhorn today, I just, I kept eating this whole tasting. I've been nibbling on it. Um, I find it irresistible. The creaminess just makes me want to keep coming back for more. 
It seems like in the chat now we have a debate. It's a lot of Schneebelhorn, a lot of uh, Holler Hocker, and now uh, Comte just just snuck in there with a couple people with the with the Pinot Grigio. So it seems seems like people are, are now now rethinking it and voting. But uh, a lot of Holler Hocker, a lot of Schneebelhorn tonight. It's a hot political landscape nowadays. You know, the cheeses, the polls, they just keep going everywhere. Um, anybody have any other questions about this world of mountain cheeses? Um, and this idea of kind of going through our AGCs, I'd be curious, you know, I know a lot of people have gone to more than one of these tastings and not right now necessarily, but please reach out, let us know what you thought about installment one. Um, I was really excited to kind of delve into one subject matter today. Um, and I'd love to hear what you all thought. We have a bunch of upcoming tastings. Um, so this, as I mentioned, is a three part series. So the next one will be Gouda's and then a cheddar deep dive. Uh, we'll just put up a two-part series where we're going to talk about conservas, which have been, dare I say, the monger's new obsession. Uh, all of us have been really into canned fish, so we're going to part one talk about canned fish and all of those traditions, and then part two, um, your mollusk and cephalopods and all those other fun creatures in the can. Um, what am I missing, guys? I'm sure I'm missing at least one pairing in there tasting. No, I think that's it. We've talked about another family one coming up, but we just have, don't have it on the books yet. Awesome. So, and of course, if anybody ever enjoys this idea and wants to do a smaller version with just your friends and family or your team at work, uh, we do a lot of private tastings. Please reach out to us at info at mongersprovisions.com and we can set up your own little tasting with all of your favorites. Um, but as long as you guys keep showing up, we're going to keep doing these. So please let us know what you want to learn about next. We love these tastings. And I just really want to thank you all from the bottom of my heart. I've had such a good time connecting with all of you, even if it's just over a screen. It's such a strange time right now. And we really enjoy being able to spend time with you guys and eat cheese and kind of do what we used to do so often. So thank you guys so much for showing up and, and choosing to be here. And, uh, we really appreciate it from the bottom of our hearts. We do have another question, Zach, that, that came oh, in okay. at, at the buzzer. Um, since Comte That's is such a heartfelt goodbye, though. Yeah, <laughs> I know, I know. It really, it really was. It was your best, uh, best yet. But um, <sighs> since the uh, Comte is so prevalent, is there another cheese you offer that is prevalent somewhere else in the world that you <laughs> offer that Americans might not know about? I know, you know, obviously cheddar is our next one. You have Gouda coming up, but what what else is there? That's a good question. Um, you know, I I do think Benji does. You know, brushing through Gouda and Cheddar real quick, uh, there are some things in there where, like, we think of it as just one thing, or and we're going to really talk about, um, you know, what what the British consider Cheddar nowadays compared to our Cheddar and some of those kind of things. Um, huh. I, I would say another one of the things that, like, is a total, you've never heard of this, or you might not know of its popularity that we do, uh, that's very culturally specific, is Ski Queen which is a Brunost. Um, so Brunost and Yetost are these whey cheeses. Um, so whey, the, the byproduct of making cheese, you can recook it, right? Ricotta is this recooked whey. I, I cook it a second time and I get a ricotta. In the case of these Norwegian cheeses, they cook it a second time and they keep cooking and keep cooking and keep cooking until it caramelizes. And so you have this uh, little brown square and, or cube actually and you would take like a truffle shaver or some small cheese planer and put thin strips on your uh, green apples or melted in various things on your toast and it's a cheese that I can say I had never heard of before the cheese counter but it's super popular in uh, you know in all of those Scandinavian countries so that that seems to be another cool one like that. There's um there's one that we don't carry currently and we Zach and I lately have been talking about bringing it in, but there's a cheese in Switzerland called Sprinz, S-B-R-I-N-Z. Um, and it's, it's a really, really delicious cheese that's kind of the, the precursor. Um, the general lore is that it's, it, it was the inspiration for Parmigiano-Reggiano. Um, and you can get it in the United States. Um, it's not very common. Most Americans have never heard of it. But my, as I mentioned before, I've got a cousin who lives in Switzerland. Her sister-in-law actually uh, is is a you know a dairy person, and she's got a herd of cows, and 
uh, they, they sell milk primarily to make sprints. And so Zach and I have been talking with them a little bit. We'd love to bring it in at some point, but it, you know, there's, um, we could get, we could get other wheels of sprints, but we'd love to get the one that's got a personal connection to us from that specific dairy, because it would be, it would be really cool to have cheese made by a family member uh, halfway across the world. Also, Sprins is absolutely fantastic. And the Sprins that they have is maybe my favorite cheese of last winter. And it was just a sample that we had to, we, get, we got to snack on. So yeah, it's, um, it's, uh, it's aged a minimum of 30 months to be, to be given the Sprins designation. Like you, if it's under 30 months, they can sell it as a different cheese called Spalin. But to be called Sprins, it has to be 30 months. So it's almost always like a three-year-old cheese um, and it is, it's really delicious. It's got a lot of the same notes as Parmesan, but it's, it's, it's its own thing too. And, but bringing it in is no small feat. They're, you know, they're similar to Parmesan. They're, you know, 80 to hundred pound wheels to, for us to arrange an import, you know, for those, we'd probably have to get at least a couple wheels to make it even remotely cost inefficient. Um, <laughs> probably no way to make it cost efficient, but you know, it's something that we're, we're going to work on. Um, and all of this actually made me think this is like the weirdest segue I've ever uh, ended a tasting with, but you know, we keep talking about the popularity of European cheeses and how in America we think of cheese as a condiment and in Europe, it's like your history and your culture. Uh, I invite you to Google McDonald's Swiss cheese, because at some point, uh, McDonald's, I believe Switzerland, um, or might have been more of more than just Switzerland, might have been more a European McDonald's. They did a whole series of burgers with these different Swiss cheeses. So there was a uh, a Sprins burger, a Gruyere burger, um, I believe an Appenzeller burger. So you can go ahead and see um, th they're much more common there, right? Like the cheese and culture is a, a different thing than in America, and so even in the worst ways, it shows up. Um, but they eat a lot more cheese, which means there's also a lot of trash cheese, but, um, we're Googling, sorry, strange tangent. We should have went with the first ending. It was way better. Um, <laughs> does anybody have any more questions tonight? Um, Look, looks like you're free to actually say goodbye this time. This okay. Thank, thank you all. We really enjoyed it. Thanks so much. We'll be back for sure. Thank you, thank you. Check it out on YouTube. We're gonna go ahead and post this in the next little bit. And if you missed any tastings before, there's a whole bunch on YouTube. So check them out and thank you all so much. Have a great night.